Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should probably check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from real experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the distilling industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. So get enrolled into this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. You know, after our Meltdown Ice Press video went viral on TikTok and Instagram, every person that comes over to my house, they want to see it in action. So I put on a block of ice, put the top on it, and you watch the melted water drip down the groove channels and you end up with a perfect sphere. Stunning is easily the best word to describe it. Go get one of your own at MeltdownIce.com. If you're looking to upgrade your sleep, do it today with a bare mattress. You're guaranteed to get the proper back support, pressure relief, and comfort or your money back. Every bare mattress is proudly made in the USA and comes with two free pillows. Try the top-rated bare mattress risk-free for 100 nights. You can learn more at baremattress.com slash bourbon. That's B-E-A-R mattress.com slash bourbon. I remember reading the, you know, the poor man's pappy. I was like, this bourboner guy knows everything. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it turns out. And then we have him on the podcast, and then I meet him. I'm like, God, he's just as dumb as I am. Not. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 291 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. I'm one of your hosts, Kenny Coleman, and before we start today's podcast talking about the MGP buyout of Luxco, here's your weekly bourbon news update. If you're in the bourbon industry, or maybe you aspire to work at a distillery, maybe a cooperage or a bottling facility, distribution, tourism, agriculture, or maybe you're just really into spirits and you're looking for a way to stay connected to what's happening inside the industry. The James B. Beam Institute Industry Conference is a part of the University of Kentucky and it's moving to a virtual conference this year and it's gonna take place on March 10th through the 12th. Topics are gonna include threats to the industry, sensory workshops, environmental law, fermentation, oak sustainability, and a lot more. Early bird registration is right now for $50 for those tickets, and it ends on March 1st, and then the tickets will increase to $75. You can learn more at beaminstitute.ca.uky.edu. And now moving on to bourbon release news. New Rift Distilling will release close to 900 bottles of a 15-year-old straight bourbon whiskey in the early spring, and all profits will be donated to the Ohio Restaurant Employee Relief Fund and the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce who's gonna disperse those funds as direct relief to individuals in need. Anchored by the Cincinnati Bourbon Society, this project aims to raise close to $120,000 in direct relief for a group that's been hard hit by the pandemic. The 15-year-old bourbon was distilled in Indiana and will be priced at $200 per bottle. Details to purchase will be coming at a later date. Luxco, or well, maybe it's MGP now, is releasing a new product called Ezra Brooks 99. It's a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey that is proofed at, well, you guessed it, 99. This release will be available nationwide starting in January of 2021 with a suggested retail price of $25. Now, I may have given away the topic for today's podcast, but MGP, that powerhouse distillery in Indiana, has purchased Luxco, who also owns Luxro Distillers in Bartstown that produces a lot of legacy and heritage brands such as Rebel Yell, Ezra Brooks, Davies County, and many more. But what does this mean? Well, the round table, we get together and we do what we do best. We speculate on what we can expect for these brands as well as MGP's existing brands such as Remus. But what does this ultimately mean for brands that have been sourcing MGP bourbon and rye for decades? Have we just witnessed the end of one of these channels of sourced avenues? Well, stay tuned to find out our thoughts. Joe from Barrel Bourbon wants you to know that it's gotten a whole lot easier to order their unique cash-strength whiskeys from around the world you can just visit BarrelBourbon.com today and click the Buy Now button. Bourbon to your door. It's as easy as that. All right, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. This week's idea comes from Mike Attack, who writes me on FredMinnick.com. So I had an idea for Above the Char. I would like to know your thoughts on pairing bourbon 
with Girl Scout cookies. I just put my yearly order in. Thanks for the note, Mike. First of all, let's uh, let's give some recognition for a cool ass name. Mike Attack should be that should be like a WWE wrestler name, or like some kind of like um, you know just like comic book name. I mean, seriously, Mike Attack sounds like a superhero name. So kudos to you for having a really cool name. If that is indeed your real name, I know it's email, so you know anybody can make anything up on email. Okay, so my thoughts on Girl Scout cookie pairings. I'm a big fan of pairing bourbon with sweets. I mean, it's basically sweet on sweet action. And I know that every year people get excited about pairing bourbon with cookies. I remember Bourbon Review did a big thing about it a few years ago, and it, it, it kind of went viral in the, in the blogosphere circles. And every year someone will do an Instagram post about it, and, you know, and, and kind of rave. But here's the thing, and I'm probably going to be an outlier here. But I actually don't like Girl Scout cookies with bourbon. I find that the bourbon really is too powerful for the Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout cookies tend to be, uh, you know, a little bit more fragile than something that's homemade. So you taste it and, you know, you've got a really nice flavor note there and it's fantastic. But then you wash it down with some bourbon and the bourbon just clears it out. You kind of like lose the flavor with all of the Girl Scout cookies. With the exception of one, that's right, there is one Girl Scout cookie that to me can stand up to bourbon, and it actually reminds me of one of my mama's recipes when I was growing up as a kid called Hello Dollies, and it's basically caramel, coconut, and dark chocolate, and that is for the Girl Scout cookie, the Samoa. The Samoa cookie, to me, can actually stand up to the weight and the flavor profile of a really good bourbon. And I like to pair this with something that has a touch of like uh, caramel in it, but also a cornbread note in there. So that kind of like nougaty, um, coconutty flavor doesn't get washed out by something that's, you know, overly sweet or overly oaked by the bourbon. So I like to have something that is, you know, six to eight years old, got some proof to it, and has that beautiful note of caramel. And my favorite pairing with the Samoa is indeed Booker's. So if you're going to give it a shot this year, I find Booker's is a very good, easy to find, pretty consistent bourbon at cast strength. Uh, Pair it with a Samoa, but that's the only only cookie I would recommend. Other bourbons to try it with, I would think would be, you know, like Old Grand 114, uh, Old Grand Dan Bottle to Bond. Essentially what I'm getting at is my favorite house brand to pair with the Samoa is Beam. I think you could also skew on over to Heaven Hill and see what an Elijah Craig, just a standard Elijah Craig would taste like with it. I think it would be a very nice pairing. But essentially, Mike, it comes down to one cookie in the Girl Scout portfolio. And I think it best matches up with the Beam portfolio. So Mike, go give that a shot. Go get you some Samoa. In fact, everybody listening, why don't you do the same? Support the Girl Scouts, get a cookie. Pair it with the bourbon. Tell us what you think. Tag us on Bourbon Pursuit and Fred Minnick and give us your thoughts. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char, folks. Big shout out to Mike Attack. Again, Mike Attack, cool ass name for this week's idea. Hey, if you have an idea for Above the Char, hit me up on fredminnick.com. That's fredminnick.com. And hit the contact uh, button and uh, shoot me your idea. Until next week, cheers. Welcome, everybody, to the 53rd Bourbon Community Roundtable. This is one of the most favorite shows, at least that I love to be able to do, because we get to bring in a lot of the best minds in blogging, in craft whiskey retailing, and everything around here to be able to just talk about accounting, what's accounting <laughs> you know, lawyering, everything like that. So it's it's always fun, and I know we can look at the download numbers, and we know that this is also everybody else's favorite podcast version as well so yeah nobody but, likes just me and you or fred so it's, it's, it's everyone else can you, can you blame <laughs> which i totally agree yeah i mean can't really blame them i mean we're we're okay on our own but when we get everybody together it looks like we we can make something kind of coherent and people actually listen and pay attention to it absolutely <laughs> let's do it let's do it so let's go ahead we'll do quick around the table and then i've got one kind of thing i want to talk about before we get into tonight's topic because we only have one topic tonight and i feel like it's it's substantial enough that we can continue to talk about it but nick go ahead and introduce yourself hey everybody nick from breaking bourbon uh breaking bourbon.com all the socials at breaking bourbon 
Uh, glad to be here, guys. Uh, glad to see the audience. So uh, kind of kick it off from here. Great. I like Blake. You uh, you started spelling your name a little bit differently on the screen here for us tonight, too. Oh, that's oh, yeah. Good. Hold on. How do I? John. Uh, <laughs> Wrong podcast. John, John Henderson loves <laughs> to uh, throw that. <laughs> he's got so, a Blake but, with an E does instead of the A. Yeah, so. he, he loves the Blake and take. Uh, um, but no, so I'm Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox.com. Um, bourbon or B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R and then Sealbox S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S. Um, yeah, always fun to be here. Um, give give my opinions and um, I don't know if they're wrong or right, but they are my opinions. So um, no, it, it's always fun to be on here and I got to mention it, but the, the longest continual streak on the bourbon round table, it, it's the Cal Ripken of the round table for a reason. So thanks again for having me. Good deal. And we'll make sure that since you are in the accounting background, it's you, Nick, as well. If you feel like giving out stock yeah. advice of either where you go, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. AMC, keep yeah. holding GameStop, you know, or like the, just uh, bye, bye, bye. Yeah. Yeah. You there just, is no rationale to anything that's going on. But but it kind of gives people a good perspective on like, yeah, market psychology is a real thing. So yeah. Animal that's spirits. Exactly. Absolutely. Brian, go ahead. All right. Thanks again, guys. Uh, Brian with Sippin' Corn. You can find me at sippincorn.com, bourbonjustice.com, and all the socials at Sippin' Corn. Really excited about this issue. I agree. It's one that we can uh, that can handle the entire episode all to itself. This is great. For sure. So there was, uh, there was some news that broke earlier today. I know this isn't going to air to the masses until about Thursday, and that was Screech passing away at the age of, of 44 and i know at least for myself like that was probably a one tv show that impacted at least myself and possibly our entire generation of just you know i think it was something that i used to watch every morning before i went to school and the summers everything like that and so i'll, I'll pose a um, kind of a fun icebreaker to you all is there a better scene in Saved by the Bell than when Jesse Spano was addicted to caffeine pills. <laughs> and and what was the song that she sang? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, it's, all of a um, I'm, I'm so excited. All, I'm so excited. Yeah. I'm going to let yeah. you all talk about this. I never watched Saved by the Bell. You never uh, watched Saved by the Bell? I didn't have I, like cable or TV in like forever when growing up in the country. So. Yep, never watched it, never got into it. So y'all have fun with this one. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm with you, Ryan. I'm gonna have to show my age. I I'm just at the cusp where I'm where I missed it. I mean, it wasn't cool for me to watch. So it's I'm with you, Ryan. Yep. Well, you you, you three talk about it. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 watch, I mean I'll I get another drink. It. But I rest think I remember it as well as you Kenny, to tell you the truth. I don't remember that particular scene, but I know we definitely watched it. I actually feel like in college we had a little stint where we were watching it for whatever reason before class. So kind of got a kick out of it at that point too. But uh, yeah, definitely a great show. Oh man. For me, like I said, it, it, it struck a chord with me, Blake or, or me. Yeah. Never seen Kenny, why, yeah. Why are we, I well, mean, we all are brothers. You grew up in the same one, house. Yeah. yeah. That, um, really into Saved by the Bell. I mean, yeah, you had Saved by the Bell. You had the college years where they bring in, what's the football player who played for the, uh, Packer, my yeah, the, yeah, the mullet and stuff. Yeah, oh, I yeah. had the mullet. I mean, there's just so many good, good uh, clips from that show. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, it is sad. You know, you, you kind of take it for granted. It is we have a character in our mind, and it is somebody's family member. But um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I'm I'm just can only think of like Saturday mornings and even before school, I could get up and there would be Saved by the Bell episode on. Like I just wish I had a what was the the place they went to eat the Max. The Max. Yeah. I always thought that was the coolest thing. I'm like, well, people hang out after school. I'm like, I go home and chat on AIM. Like <laughs> people actually <laughs> people actually hang out and see friends. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, uh, I I agree. I mean, it was it was something that it was really near and dear to my childhood. And I think a lot of people as well. So like I said, it's, uh, it's, it's tough to see that, but rest in peace, screech Dustin mm, Diamond. Yep. All sure. right. Let's, uh, let's move on to our main topic of the night. So if you haven't been anywhere near a, a, a computer or near bourbon in the past week, you might've missed it, but MGP has announced the intent to acquire Luxco. 
Um, if I remember correctly, it was around, I think it was at $75 million. No, what was it? 400, $400 million. Yeah. million. Yeah. So uh, there was a four in, somewhere in there, right? <laughs> One of the Lux has got the four, 75 million <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was 475 million. Cash. Exactly. So 475 million uh, split between cash and stock. Now, there has been a lot of stuff that's come out of this in regards of, you know, at least us personally, in the very, when it first started coming out, we were all kind of thinking to ourselves like, oh gosh, like what's going to happen? Um, you know, what's going to happen to, you know, Rebel Yell and Ezra Brooks or like they may be replaced with MGP or what's going to happen to the supply chain for everybody that's doing contract distillation. And so there's been some things that have kind of come out, but I think we'll, we'll kind of talk about it um, a little bit here as well. Now, there also was one joke that came out of last week. I saw Chuck Cowdery had posted on his Facebook page and talked about this, you know, 475 million. And this was also at the time when all the big lotteries were happening. And with inside of Chuck's comments, somebody said, well, there's some asshole in Michigan that can do two of these. <laughs> <laughs> they won the $1 billion uh, mega millions. Well, one after taxes. Let's, let's get there. It. You go. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Here comes the Come economy. Right? Yeah. He's prepping right. for the tax season. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, did he take the one time payment? Did he take the lifetime payment? Yeah. There's <laughs> always take the one time payment. Always, always. Always. Hopefully, we're one of us is in that situation one time in our life. <laughs> so I'll, um, I'll, I'll hand it over to to one of you all first. Like, let's kind of just get thoughts and perspective. Like, is this a good buy? Is this like weird? Like, what were, what would you all kind of think in here? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Well, not to just jump straight in, but uh, I'd say it's a great move for MGP. You know, I think we talked about it on one of our last roundtables of you know what what acquisitions do we expect, and I think I don't know if it was my, one. myself or somebody else, but said like MGP should go go purchase like a smoke wagon or somebody because MGP hasn't done a great job of developing their own labels. I mean, that they're, they're, they're trying with Remus that seems to be catching on a little bit, but not nearly as much as it, it should. Um, but obviously they have plenty of other products on the market and other brands that are able to use their barrels and be very successful. So, you know, I think just with rebel yell, with the blood oath, with, um, let's go as Davies counties as well too. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, so, so they've cool. got a, yeah, they've got a pretty strong portfolio. So I think it makes a lot of sense for them to, uh, I don't know if they'll immediately start shifting stocks over, but, um, I think just Salesforce distribution, all that stuff, it makes a lot of sense. And from a consumer perspective, I, I'm not mad about it either. You know, I'm not like, Oh my word, they're going to ruin my rebel yell. Like, I think it'll be it'll be fine. So um, I to me, it was a win win. Well, definitely a win for if you were an owner of Luxco and e even a consumer or an MGP. I think they needed to do it just because they're getting pressure on their, you know, they're publicly traded. So they're getting pressure on a lot of different fronts. But, yeah, I, I think it was a good move. I agree with that, and, and particularly on the point of the brands, because Luxco has been so great with its brands mm -hmm. with, you know, let's face it, some limited stock. I mean, they're, they still have a relationship with Heaven Hill, and I wonder, you know, what happens with that now. But they had limited stock, and they really pushed a lot of good brands, got a lot of you know, social media presence, presence behind Rebel Yell and their whole social media campaign with that. They're bringing out all these new brands. And that's what MGP was horrible at, their own brands. And so I think it's a it's a great fit. You've got someone with practically an unlimited supply, and you've got another side that's fantastic with brands. So it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, I'm going to jump in too and kind of say I agree with all that. Um, yeah, I mean, we may not have a whole hour to talk about this. I mean, we, we need a dissenting opinion. Yeah, we'll start making stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> to try to make something up here. Um, you know, if I if if I think about Luxco, you know, of any brand that recently has kind of like come into, you know, light, but not, you know, I guess so much so that they're unacquirable or or you wouldn't think of them as someone to acquire. Luxco is a really good example, I think, of a brand that really fits for that. You know, they're they're getting stronger, you know, in, in the eyes of, you know, consumers. I know in my own perspective, I've seen their brands 
get stronger, you know, whether that's how much that's transit, you know, translated to actual sales, I'm not sure, you know, but then combine that with MGP, who really has had just such a hard time getting any kind of brand and name recognition has been, you know, behind all these brands. And, you know, hey, MGP makes, you know, all kinds of food products too, you know, which a lot of people maybe don't necessarily know that, you know, so here's this company that's very, I think, business focused and, you know, is looking for long-term positioning and it's, it's a, it's a perfect fit for them to come in with somebody that's got momentum, the momentum that Luxco has, they could feed into that. And frankly, I don't, I don't think MGP could start something themselves to give it that kind of momentum. I mean, would they be 20, 30 years out in the future? Maybe never. I just don't think they could have done it without acquiring. And Luxco seems like maybe the best bet that could have happened. I mean, I think it's a, Ryan, go ahead. You had something you want to say. Oh no! I mean, I'll basically are regard. You just, you just agree everyone with everybody else. Like, come on, what everyone else has to say. <laughs> no, I, disagree. I, mean, I will disagree with Brian that I thought Luxro was limited too until I saw that they did a four point eight nine four point eight million nine liter case volume last year, and you're like, holy cow! You know, I didn't realize they, they were that that much. <laughs> yeah, according well, to this which, uh, press release, and but then you dig in, but then you yeah. dig into it, and you you know they they have their bourbons, but they have also an El Mayer tequila. They have an Everclear a vodka brand. Mm -hmm. um, and two people, you know, we relate MGP with bourbon, but like Brian, or I'm not, uh, Nick said that, you know, they do food, but they do a ton of vodkas and gins and tequilas for who else knows who buys, uh, you know, those types of products. And so it, it makes sense because like you all, you know, said they've kind of had a hard time, uh, getting their own brands and getting traction with them. it's a little confusing and i would be concerned as uh someone if i'm buying you know barrels or having inventory made by mgp because it does seem like you know they they kind of cannibalize themselves with the business model of you know we're going to be contract distillers and they kind of you know had these crazy prices and then they got a new ceo or whatever and they then they were starting to sell them for cheap and then so now this is a higher margin you know to have their own brands but then it's like okay luxro's got a lot of you know 4.8 million cases that's a lot of distillate you got to do to support those brands plus everyone else on top of that so maybe they're big enough to handle it but i don't know that seems like someone's gonna have to give at some point and i know they've sent out letters to people you know that they're doing business with saying hey we're still going to focus on you and we're still going to be there but it just be interested to see how much you know, if they gain traction with Luxro or whatever, all those brands, if they start to phase out the contract distillation side. Yeah, we'll we'll take that uh, here in a second. I I, I think that's a, a a good point to do. You know, I I th we also came to this as a very bourbon centric mind point coming through here, right? Thinking like, oh God, what's going to happen to Rebel Yell? What's going to happen to contract distillation? But as you all pointed out, yeah, there's there's gin, there's vodka, there's a lot of other stuff that they do that can help fill that portfolio. So we have a very skewed way of looking at this, of just being like, oh, this yeah. is a huge bourbon play. Oh, it's a huge bourbon play. Why would you do that? And, and honestly, I, Blake, you, you made a great point. Like, I'm still unclear why they didn't just buy Smoke Wagon and start pumping all. I mean, they're buying their stuff already. It's just more MGP. Like, all you're doing is just buying the label at this point. So that would have been, in my opinion, a, a really good buy if they would have gone that route. But instead it's so of tiny, you know, it's like, yeah, but that's the point is they could just why not do that with multiple brands like yeah. own, go on yeah, five brands that go yeah. smoke wagon, but not the common public. And so they're I feel like you're having a hard you're once again trying to convince the public, okay, here's one of our brands again that nobody's heard of except Bourbon Geeks. And then whereas Luxro kind of has this mainstream, more popular uh brands that've been around forever. And so right. I think it makes more sense to invest in that and then something that here we are again trying to convince somebody to jump on with no pun intended the wagon uh to uh <laughs> <laughs> jump on the smoke wagon yeah jump yeah. on the smoke wagon so i i, I see both sides of it but i mean i i think what we're kind of undervaluing is like just the random I, i'd love to see a breakdown of the the cases that they sold what how many did you say it was almost five million essentially yeah um, 4.8 million of non-liter case volume it, yeah, but it doesn't so, say what's bourbon what's exactly tequila, what, and i think we put a lot of emphasis emphasis on the bourbon when really what's actually making them the money is the you know probably the 
3.9 million cases of Everclear and some random gin we've never seen and some vodka we've never heard of. Um, but all that to say, I still think like if they picked up a few MGP sourced brands, that would take them a long way as well. Because, you know, it's the same thing that why why is Wheatley Vodka so prominent and you know popular now it's it's good vodka there's no doubt about that but every bar restaurant retailer knows they need to buy a ton of wheatley vodka to get the limited stuff so i think you know somebody else needs to come in and perfect that model um but and nobody has at least it seems like it so far and but i think the biggest thing is you know a smoke wagon and all these i mean yeah they're popular but they don't have distribution set up. Whereas Lux Row is literally, they were distributors and that's, yeah. they have wide distribution. They have all the channels to make it happen. And so they're already like primed for a, a big brand to come and just move it across the nation. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that was a necessity, you know, with the deal. I think that's what GP would have been after was that distribution and the momentum that they had. And, you know, I, you think about like Smoke Wagon and some of these smaller, you know, call brands like that or MGP sourced. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think that MGP owning those brands could ever do what, you know, that independent brand owner can do from a just, you know, marketing standpoint and, and you know, the uniqueness standpoint. And, you know, it's, it's good for MGP to have these, you know, these independent you know, brands out there because they got people putting everything they have into their mm-hmm. brand, all their personality, all their character. You know, they don't have the corporate bullshit that they have to deal with, which is going to water everything down. It's going to slow everything down. Stuff's going to go through a review process before, you know, it hits market and that kind of stuff. You know, some of them hit, some of them miss, but I think that's really good for MGP. And if you think about their long term, you know, what's their long term play as a business? You know, do you want to be behind everybody where no one who's you are? No one really knows who you are. Or do you want some control over that brand awareness? Do you want to have some control over the other side of the market that's getting you out in front of consumers directly? And I think it's just it's just a diversification strategy for them. I think they're a lot more looking at just the numbers than, you know, really breaking down brands and things like that. I mean, they're looking at the numbers they're projecting. They're saying, we got money. Let's diversify. Here's the way to do it. And I, th- I think it's that simple from their standpoint. Yeah, you make a really good point about the sales force. I think that is the key point. I mean, Ryan hit on distribution, but Luxco has the sales force. And that is what you need. You need those boots on the ground that can go. And we've talked about that's what MGP's biggest problem is, is they have a problem with getting Remus, 8 Sand, like all this stuff that they haven't really, really connected with a lot of bourbon drinkers and trying to get them you know, and trying to get it to more places across the country and really trying to tell that story because I'm sure that's exactly what they're missing and what they're trying to do. But at the same exact time, they're also able to capitalize on the success of already the existing bourbon brands that Luxco already owns and, and what they're able to do. Now, yeah. there's a there's a flip side of this, and I think that's where uh, we'll get to this too. And uh, I believe, yeah, Brandon kind of put this in the chat here. So when we start thinking of, and this is this is a real real concern of what is going to happen when Luxro brands continue to grow in popularity. So you've got things like Bell Mead, Smoke Wagon, Old Scout, so on and so forth. And as things might go more towards Remus, more towards Eight Sand, more towards you know they take their older stocks and they want to put it towards their own product because they're going to able to make more margin on it. Are we going to see a lot of these, a lot of the source market either start getting squeezed a little bit more, start getting, I mean, is it a phase out as Ryan kind of said, like, what do you all kind of think there? I would be nervous if I was them. I mean, yeah, you got probably be. Luxro never thought Heaven Hill would stop producing for them. Bullet never thought Four Rose would stop making for them. Will it, same thing. And then, you know, they, they if I were them, I would get ahead of the curve and start get with Barstown Bourbon Company or OZ Tyler or um or trying to get my own still um i'd be really nervous right now because uh it's a higher profit margin you know when they when they're selling to their own brands and yeah i'd be nervous which is that maybe one of uh mgp's long-term strategies is to get ahead of that a little bit and you know maybe they don't want to be in the bulk whiskey business as much as they have in the past um I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I still think there's plenty of bourbon to go around and um, with with newer kind of 
contract, major contract distillers coming on. I think those those brands that we mentioned will will find a place for really good bourbon. But um, it is interesting. I think one of the other points that I should have brought up earlier is I think they pro or uh, MGP probably likes that there's like a tourist ac- aspect of the Luxco a- acquisition. You know, they they like having that place in Bardstown where people can visit and um, all of that as well. But you know, as far as brands getting squeezed, I, I think that's going to continue to happen. You know, every, everybody's going to get pushed out eventually, unless you kind of hold your own destiny, so to say. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to, whether it's Bardstown Bourbon or any of these really focused contract distillers, I mean, that's where you're going to have to go. And I, and MGP has got to be looking away from that. I think that's what this shows. You, you not only get the great tourist attraction, but you get the cachet of the Kentucky DSP number, mm-hmm. you, you get all of those, you know, you, you get, you know, you're on the, on the bourbon trail. You, I mean, when I first saw uh, Lux Row, I mean, it really was only second best to the approach drive to Woodford. I mean, you, you mm-hmm. drive down that narrow road, you've got trees on both sides, it's farmland around. It's, I mean, it's beautiful and they built yeah. a beautiful still room. I mean, all of it's just top notch. I mean, MGP just, yeah, they didn't start from scratch here. They started with just a fantastic site, and it it puts them right in the heart of, of bourbon. Now I know, like everyone's saying, it's it's all the other spirits and brands too. But from our bourbon centric point of view, I mean, they're right here, ground floor. And it, it also, I think, it it follows the the script of building a beautiful distillery and selling it. I mean, that's what a lot of these new places are doing. I mean, Bardstown Bourbon's really maybe the one bucking that trend, but everybody else, you, you build it and then you sell it. Uh, and I didn't see that coming from Lux, from Luxco at all. And I the peacocks too with the, the, you know, the beautiful distiller. Have you ever been there? There's the peacocks. My, it was my buddy's farm that they sold to Luxro. So, uh, oh, yeah. there's, it, the there's peacock came with it. Yeah. It, bad joke. Inside joke. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was seeing some kind of, uh, some points in the chat too that you know was thinking about this as well you know thinking of some of these other brands that you know have sourced from mgp and are now moving away you know thinking about their long-term positioning you know a lot of brands sourcing from mgp are are smaller brands you know if you think of the industry tightening you know, certainly smaller brands could be some of the first to go um you know we've seen it historically you know the larger you know the larger big distilleries survived, you know, all the little guys didn't, um, you know, from that perspective, I mean, if they have everything resting on, you know, this, you know, all these small brands kind of everywhere, that's one play, but if they don't have control themselves and a good, you know, piece of that, that, you know, they could, they could see themselves squeeze this MGP in the future, you know, so that diversification strategy, um, long-term, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. Again, it just kind of feeds back into the fact that it seems like a, a absolutely perfect fit. And if you're MGP, you, you want to get your, you, you want to get your teeth into this thing and you want to get a solid distribution strategy. You want to get some solid brands and you're gonna be able to propel that forward. You're going to be able to get through a tough time, you know, things of that nature. So there is one thing that actually came as, as Ryan had mentioned at the top of the show here that MGP actually sent out an email to customers, which of course being in sort of the source side of ourselves, we actually got that email. Are you a private barrel club looking for total control over your own label or perhaps a retailer wanting low minimums on a private label bourbon that sells, or maybe you're just a business, an organization or charity, and you're looking to make a statement with your own gift of a barrel pick. Indiana's own Krogman's makes it super easy. Make the pilgrimage to Bloomington, Indiana, where tucked away in the old Otis Elevator factory, you can select your own barrel or barrels and discuss every detail of your bottle, from the label, the cap, and the closure, and create something truly unique. So stop putting stickers on picks and take your club to the next level. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S.com to learn more. Spirits of French Lick exploded onto the distilling scene early in 2016 as Indiana's largest double pot still distillery. They employ old world sentiment with new world attitudes, delivering the finest handcrafted bottle and bond bourbons to an audience eager for an alternative to the big guys. And their distiller, Alan Bishop, uses historic Hoosier yeast strains, alternative grains, and 53 gallon number two char barrels to bring you spirits with unparalleled quality and depth of flavor. 
You can find all Spirits of French Licks products and new releases on sealbox.com. But don't just take Fred Minnick's word for it. Find out for yourself. Check out spiritsoffrenchlick.com and follow them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, always drink responsibly. MGP actually sent out an email to customers, which, of course, being in sort of the source side of ourselves, we actually got that email. And so it says in there, it says the Luxco partnership will expand our capabilities to include bottling and distribution services, which will help round out the best in class distillation and blending MGP has offered for decades. So I don't know if that's like, uh, hey, we're just going to put, you know, the warm fuzzies on you real quick to make you don't (laughs) make sure you don't freak out. But Ryan's right. I think I think there is something to to potentially be future worried about in the short term. I think it's okay. Like you have nothing to worry about. You've got at least a a good year to figure figure out what it's going to be. But we've all seen on the source side, those barrels crept up in price, went a little bit back down. And we'll kind of see where it's going to be now that they're going to have a larger distribution channel to be able to get that out there. So it'll be interesting to see that. There was something in the chat, uh, Robert Warren and <coughs> other people said, you know, what happens to Yellowstone and Stephen Beam, Matt F about Limestone Branch? How does this factor into it? So if you go and listen to the podcast that we recorded with Stephen Beam, Luxco is like just a partial ownership in it. It's not a it's not like an all out stakes ownership. So I don't think we're going to see too much change there. The, and if I'm not mistaken, the way that the Yellowstone brand actually works is they actually blend their their distillate with their Luxco Ezra Brooks slash Heaven Hill distillate to kind of form that particular brand. And knowing that that is not something that's moving 5 million cases, probably, you're probably going to not, I don't think you're going to see that change in the short term, but I would also guess that as a long-term strategy, Yellowstone is going to try and, and, and it also kind of goes to what other people here on the chat have said, you know, MGP might've been seeing the, the writing on the walls. Um, you know, shout out to Jay here actually saying that, and that they don't need MGP anymore because they have to, you know, they're distilling on their own and that might be what Yellowstone's going to do. Yeah. They, they're starting to distill on their own. Now they don't need as much, uh, stock that's going to be coming directly from, uh, Luxco because, but they needed it to kind of get off the ground, but you know, future, future forward looking kind of thing, sort of thing there. Yeah. They, they really took uh limestone away from that, you know, that really sweet moonshine with a little, you know, circle handle on those bottles. I mean, to, to actual bourbon production. So that was nice for them, but I don't really see a place for limestone branch anymore. I mean, I, I suspect they're going to get cut loose um, Steve and his brother will be able to buy it back or, or something else. There's just, there's really no need to have limestone branch in that family anymore. I don't know. I mean, I feel like, well, I feel like Yellowstone especially has, has a good place, but you know, regular limestone branch and I don't know the, the details of what they're doing, but, um, I, I'd, I'd see them really liking the Yellowstone label. You don't think so? Yeah. I think it looks good. I mean, it's, it's it's a it's a legacy. It's a heritage brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Think put gasoline on it and maybe jumpstart it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you meant like literally put gasoline like you well, didn't no. like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just curious. I, when I thought this, I don't know when it happened. I don't know why I thought this. I was like, well, maybe Lux Row just didn't like their new distillate, and they're like, we gotta get somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we had heaven hill we tried our own we got to go somewhere else <laughs> has, anybody had, has anybody had i uh, haven't no i mean it's only like distillate? two or three years old i think yeah it's yeah it's three i think maybe you right would, now you would think something would have uh i'm sure it's good. they got a ton of yeah. good people that have come from you know some of the best in the area and not, i'm sure it's fine but yeah i was just i don't know why i thought you, you gotta say something like that yeah <laughs> We've been far too positive this entire time. Yeah, I know. I feel like somebody needs, needs to say like, well, yeah, FEMA was over at Luxco a few weeks ago. and <laughs> <laughs> well, here, There's I'll, some I'll, kind of re- re- regulatory uh, issues. I'll put this in, a, a, in another direction here. I actually had this kind of question queued up, but Greg from Bourbon Finds kind of put it here so we can put on the, uh, the, the screen here for us. We know that a lot of the Luxco brands and the bourbon side in particular all say Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Now, Ooh. as you want to start scaling these up and you're thinking of Rebel Yell, you're thinking That's of Ezra Brooks, these, these heritage brands that have been around forever, could we see the word Kentucky fall off? 
Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I don't think people notice though. I mean, yeah, I'm looking, yeah. you know, especially if you're familiar with the label, it it's such a small, you know, component typically. I, I I think people assume bourbon is from Kentucky if they're not looking. Whether it is or not is irrelevant. You know, I think a lot of brands, if you were to ask somebody who's unfamiliar and, and it is from Indiana or somewhere else, they're gonna say Kentucky just because they think that's where it's from. Uh I don't I don't know that that's a I don't know that's a deal breaker, especially with an established brand. And and I think you'll probably see some of the brand versions be Indiana and some still say Kentucky. Um, and that'll only contribute to that. You don't, you know, you're not paying attention to where it's from because it's just it's Rebel Yell, it's Ezra Brooks, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But I think you'll particularly see it on the rye. Um, maybe a little bit less on the bourbon, but you're gonna see all of these brand extensions on rye whiskey and it's all going to be indiana rye that's probably very very true that makes it so confusing because you do have these <laughs> great like <laughs> kentucky you know you're in kentucky have the like beautiful property you got these kentucky brands and then there's gonna be an in on the back but that's like right. you said, most people don't care but for me i'd be like this is confusing i don't know what to do with it make with this but but i think that goes back to just being you know into bourbon like don't get me wrong if you're listening to this podcast you're here live on the chat, we are savvy enough to know that we can look at a back of the bottle and say, and see where it's distilled at and know what a DSP is. Mm -hmm. If it's missing something, we, we, we know how to examine that, but the general public doesn't, they, they have no idea. And heritage brands like Ezra Brooks and Rebel Yell are just, they've always been there and they've always been, you know, somewhere in the, the mid to lower shelves, you know, somewhere in like the, what, 20, $25 range, like good value brands and stuff like that. It'll be interesting to kind of see if this would happen. I personally, I hope I don't see that happen. I hope I don't see Kentucky fall off only because they do. They have a legacy. It's been around. I mean, it's old Stitzel Weller stuff from Rebel Yell. I mean, Ezra Brooks. I mean, we've talked about it in the podcast before. It's literally nobody. It's the name came out of nowhere. It's made out of thin air. I mean, there's not a there's not a real good story there, but it is a heritage brand. There's and a great story there. there. Some, someone just read some. There's some book. I forget what it is, but that yeah. whole story. <laughs> If it only we knew what, what book only. we could read. If only. <laughs> if only there was a large poster or yeah, somewhere <laughs> behind somebody. <laughs> and um, who's at the MGP doesn't plan to maybe distill in Kentucky too? I mean, what, you know, do we, do we believe they plan to do all distillation operations where they are now or that they would consider, you know, opening up, up their smaller distillery, you know? And, and I, I get asked the question too. I mean, what about the long-term play? If you're, you know, we talked about smoke wagon, we talked about how that wouldn't necessarily be a play right now, but you know, if they've got a distribution in the feet on the ground, you know, who, who's to say that now MGP has that they have strong brands that are sourcing from them. They identify, you know, those strong brands. And now look, you insert a strong band, brand, you immediately add a tremendous amount of value. The person or people who started it, they're happy. They just walked off mm -hmm. with, couple million bucks, whatever they get. And MGP's happy because now they can take that brand and it's multiplied by 50. I mean, it presents a tremendous opportunity for them to, you know, add immediate value to these brands that are already sourcing from them and really doing all the hard work and the market testing and everything else up front. You know, that's not to say that they're going to, you know, have the same passion that, you know, the founder's going to have, but Look, if they can get it everywhere, I mean, look at High West. I think of any example of a company, you know, High West, I feel like David Perkins, there was a lot of passion there, you know, since he sold it, you know, now it's kind of, it's kind of everywhere, but I don't know how many people are, you know, looking on the shelves now really think about those, those original days when, you know, when they were, you know, sourcing from all over, they were one of the original kind of blenders from multiple States and doing some different things. You know, I don't know how much that matters now to today's market. So who's to say MGP couldn't just do the same thing. And now that they've got the two avenues in play, they could really add a lot of value there. That's a good yeah. point. That's a good point. I think at the end of the day, it kind of shows like how MGP values Kentucky bourbon as well. You know, the, we're tired of being that, in Indiana. The, it, well, <laughs> I, not to say that like, that's kind of like the underlying theme of this, but I mean, it, it's Hoosiers have always envied Kentuckians. Uh, yeah, you, you know, I'm sure. Kentucky. I'm sure they love the distribution. I'm sure they love the you know the strong brand equity that some of the labels already have at um, Lexco. But at the end of the day, I think they they like being able to deal in Kentucky bourbon. So, 
Okay, I'll take this on a flip side that maybe nobody even thought about. So we know that MGP is very big, big on contract distillation. What if they just like crank it up to 11 over at Lux Row and start selling Kentucky stuff on the market? Ooh, I'd be in. So like a Remus Kentucky? No, 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 no. Like, no they, like they sell, they sell contract distillation oh, in Lux Row. On well, the I mean, in the, hasn't that always kind of been Lux Row's um, business model? Like, you, you know, they do contract or are they not like on the Bardstown bourbon side of things? I don't think I, yeah, they no, are I think, right now. Yeah. They had been the, the contract purchaser. Now they had their own, but that, that's a good point. Hmm. So MTP is yeah, buying be the ability to put Kentucky on those labels. I mean, I mean, that's a good point. We're talking about like, you, you know, all these brands getting squeezed. Maybe it's the other way around. And they're saying like, Hey, not only can we offer you, you know, Indiana bourbon at, five, six, seven years old, whatever it is, we can offer you Kentucky straight bourbon at four years old. I think that's a that would be probably the even better play. I think you figured it out, Kenny. It all makes sense (laughs) now. I totally understand it all. I mean I threw it out there as like a like a maybe what if, but I don't feel that that would actually happen because we all know Ryan, we know best of trying to start whiskey and begging people for barrels that right. everybody is holding on to their stocks super super tight and they need them for their own products so i wouldn't i really wouldn't think that happened i think that lux row will continue to hold on their barrels and start putting it towards their own product um, but never say never well I but they I like this idea they at least bring the cash in to be able to increase production. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of production schedule Lux Row has been on, but they, they can run the still 24 seven now. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> and, and maybe an extra day a week if they wanted to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Find another day, just do it. Yeah, eight days a week. Why not? Yeah. So, yeah. so maybe they go just the rye in Indiana, and bourbon in Kentucky moving forward. Mm-hmm. You know, the rise and gins and everything else in Indiana. Bourbon yeah, Indiana bourbon. rye has such a good name. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. They're all, they're all watching like this. They, 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 their whole strategy was like, we're just going to do this. We're going to watch this podcast, <laughs> figure out what all the good see, ideas are. See what CISA yeah, says okay. about it, and that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the board's going to listen to this in their meeting the on, on Thursday or Friday. Right yeah. Yeah, they're going to listen to this. can't wait to, to see them meeting. like, hey, guys, uh, slow down the Zoom call. We're going to throw on the, the bourbon round table. Let everybody <laughs> listen to all 45 minutes. Then we'll decide. <laughs> decide which Wait, we're gonna go. What should our strategy be? We just dropped a half a million dollars. Now let's let these jokers tell us. What you know, they said we should distill in Kentucky. Let's do that now. <laughs> like, oh, shit. Why didn't I think about that before? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I think it will be interesting. It will be fun to kind of see how this is going to play out in an just to kind of circle back to the very beginning, I I do believe that Ryan is right that some of these brands should be a little bit worried about what's going to happen to their future stocks. Maybe not in the first year, maybe not in the second year, but definitely as it keeps going, as we've seen the bourbon boom go. I know Ryan and Blake and I, we had a lot of these good discussions uh, a few weeks ago and we're all together and thinking that, gosh, guys, we've been doing this now for six years and we keep saying like, oh God, we've got to be at the, we're, we're at the peak, right? We're at the peak. And, you know, we came back and started talking like, I still think we're just getting started. Like this is still early stages of what we're going to see in the growth of bourbon. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, MGP investing like this, I mean, it's got to be the infant stages or, you know, they're, I, I just don't think they would do it at, you know, this late in the game, but it's, it blows my mind away every year. I'm like, this has got to be it. <laughs> that uh, just keeps on going. Let's keep going. I, I love it. Poppy prices can't get higher. Can they? Like, <laughs> No, <laughs> I can remember uh, this was probably 2017, 2016. I have this lo- local few guys. And I was like, all right, Pappy, it's going to a thousand dollars. They're like, it's $450. If it ever goes over $500, that's going to be ridiculous. And now I'm like, shoot! I should have shorted Pap or, or <laughs> whatever the uh, you yeah, know AMC of the world put a put on Pappy for those prices back in the day. But yeah, <laughs> I, I I think we'll continue to see at least another decade of strong growth. Um, and that's you know some of that's anecdotal, but 
also just looking at, you know, who's buying on seal box, who's visiting bourbon or it's a younger crowd. And I just don't, I really don't think like tomorrow they're going to wake up and be like, Oh, you know what? I love vodka. Like I, I think that kind of took its, you know, short dip and we'll continue to see growth, but who knows? Everybody's been watching the stock market this week. We're all like, yeah, some dips, some calls. We'll put some options on it. <laughs> yeah. Just throw a bunch of lingo out there. And we see all got the words. Now. See what works. Yeah. Oh man, but guys, this has been a this has been a fun roundtable. That that forty five minutes went pretty quick of this one topic. But I I thought this was a pretty substantial topic that we didn't really need to talk about much else because this has a significant impact on, of course, for for Luxro and MGP, but also the overall bourbon market of what we are going to see for a lot of the contract and source brands that are out there that heavily, heavily rely on MGP. So it'll be good to kind of see exactly what this is going to entail for the next, uh, I guess, six months to six years. And uh, we'll still be here. We'll still talk about it like, time yeah. to time. So Heck yeah. When that I never, Rebel 95 Rye comes out, we're all going to go <laughs> get it. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I'm in. You'll call it Rebel 95. Yeah, so like, should we should we put some more uh, 2024 Ideas. connections out there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we all go invest in uh, Wheatley vodka. Is that the idea? It's going to be going for 500 bucks a month. <laughs> no, 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 no. You never know. <laughs> Everything you know, turns full yeah. circle back to the uh, 80s era, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I also want to say, since Fred wasn't here tonight, you know, he did make the early prediction that he thought it was going to be four roses selling the Kieran, uh, or sorry, four roses of Kieran actually selling it, but it ended up being a different distillery. So uh, he was right about some sort of major buyout, and that happened a month one. So we've got got a, got a long year ahead of us, fellas. Was that your way of saying, "Hey, Fred couldn't make it," but just want to point out that he was, he was wrong. wrong. So yeah. <laughs> he's not here to defend himself, but he was. Thanks wrong. for thanks for not being here, Fred. <laughs> you feel better. Uh, yeah, we, we can That's get away. That's why he didn't him. show up. He didn't have the yeah. sleepies. He yeah. just didn't want to be proven wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, guys, let's go ahead and kind of close it out. So Nick, I'll let you go first. Sure, sure. Uh, always a fun time, guys. Uh, Nick from Breaking Bourbon. Uh, breakingbourbon.com, uh, all the socials at Breaking Bourbon. Uh, th this was a fun top topic. I got to admit, uh, I wasn't sure we'd have a full 45 minutes to, to talk about, but you know, I think it's it's interesting now to kind of watch what's going to happen with this. And you know, I don't think we've really seen something like this happen before, and so it's going to be very interesting to see what MGP does with it. And I think uh, everybody's kind of. I don't know, a little bit excited about this acquisition, tell you the truth. I think everyone's kind of uh, curious what's going to happen going forward. And frankly, that's what makes this a lot of fun. And I think why we're still seeing bourbon kind of on that up is we've got just a lot of interest in it. And people actually want to come on and, and, and chat and talk about this. We want to talk about this. I'm excited to talk about this. So, you know, great to be here. Great to have everybody on. And uh, again, great chat with you guys. As yep. always, Blake. Yeah. Thanks again. You know, I'll keep it short. Uh, Blake from Bourboner and Sealbox. Always fun to come on and yeah, speculate. Sometimes we're wrong, sometimes we're right, but hopefully you kind of pick up some good stuff along the way. So thank you all for watching and listening. And uh, Kenny and Ryan, thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, sure. And then Brian Hera Esquire. Esquire. There you go. <laughs> Um, I never saw this coming. I mean, it's, and that's kind of what's fun about it is, you know, some brands, you know, they're going to sell, you know, they're, they're, they're set themselves up to sell. That's the whole business model. I never saw it coming here. I went to the groundbreaking, some of the, you know, grand opening events at, at Lux Row. Uh, never, ever saw this coming. And that's what's kind of exciting about it. So thanks for having me on this one. It's a great topic. Enjoyed talking about it. Find me at Sip and Corn in bourbonjustice.com and all the socials at Sip and Corn. Cheers, guys. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Ryan, I always, I always yeah. close it out. You want to do a good closeout for us? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, this was exciting. This is the fun stuff. You know, I feel like it was bigger than, you know, Matthew Stafford getting traded for Jared Goff. You know, it's like, uh, mm. never saw this coming. It's super exciting for Bardstown. I think, um, you know, Lux row is, was been a great addition to the, the bourbon trail and MGP moving in, you know, and mm. helping that take off is even better. So, uh, I think it's just great for everyone involved. It's super exciting to watch. I love the speculation. That's the fun part and try to understand why this was done. And so, yeah, super fun. Always love hanging out with you guys. And I'm so grateful for everyone that tunes in, chats in, you know, so it's, it's all, it's all good. So let's keep this going. All right. Thanks everybody. Cheers. And we'll see you all 
next week. Mm-hmm.